I'm Dan Carell, CEO of the Digital Commerce Alliance, and this is Commerce Code, a weekly digital commerce podcast for leaders in card linking, loyalty and digital marketing, mobile wallets and payments, and financial data. Thanks for joining this running conversation with leaders in the industry. And if this podcast is helpful to you, come join us at the Digital Commerce Alliance. You can learn more at www.digcomall.org. This week, Dan is talking with Ahmed Siddiqui from Branch, and we'll be learning more about what he terms the anatomy of the swipe. Specifically, he'll discuss teaching fintech to newcomers. Before we get to that interview, we'll dig into four of the big stories in digital commerce from the last week. First, inflation and recession, the macro trends we're experiencing now. Second, MasterCard's insights on how banking as a service will scale this year. Third, loyalty programs to watch in 2023. Fourth, Gen Z's take on TikTok. All that's ahead, and of course, the main event, Ahmed Siddiqui with Branch. Commerce Code is brought to you in part by Vantage Score. Nine of the top 10 banks and over 3,000 leading banks and fintechs use Vantage Score to predict and manage repayment risk. Learn more about the latest advances in credit scoring and how to grow your lending business by leveraging financial inclusion at VantageScore.com. Economic news across the board is looking up. Inflation in the U.S. fell in December to its lowest level in more than a year. A sign price pressures have peaked. Financial Times reports inflation declined for the sixth consecutive month. In related news, 98% of CEOs around the world anticipate an economic downturn in 2023, but believe it will be shorter and less hard-hitting than previously predicted. Most are focused on getting through it without job cuts, according to an annual survey by the conference board. BAAS, that stands for Banking as a Service. Finastra estimates Banking as a Service represents a $7 trillion opportunity by the year 2030. Increasingly, fintechs and other service providers are partnering with banks. Why? To give their clients and their customers greater access to financial services. Banking as a service gained momentum during the pandemic. With the need to stay home came consumer demand to live their lives, including their financial lives, on platforms and through apps. Fintechs and their clients sought to meet that demand by offering more than just the ability to open and manage accounts online. They set out to provide banking services everywhere via embedded finance within their own apps. MasterCard is one such BAAS provider slash platform that now offers one-stop shop functionality to embed financial services into websites and apps. In recent reporting by payments, Adding a modern layer of tech that fits on top of legacy operations is a boon for fintechs and banks, of course, but those who benefit most are consumers. In the U.S., there are literally a million different retail rewards programs. Customer Think created a list of six interesting ones to watch in the coming year. One, Bloomtopia, the feminine youth health brand, is all about fun. It uses sound think Rooster's Crowing, to signal to customers they've received an award. Two, Hugo Boss Experience. This retailer provides easy-on-the-eyes member experiences, first access to products, discounts, and it gives birthday gifts. Three, Levi's Red Tab. Innovative rewards include free alterations, discounts on custom embroidery, and direct-to-garment printing. Four, Chipotle Rewards. There are a lot of opportunities to earn points, in-store, online, or via the app. They can be redeemed for food, branded products, or you can donate them to a cause. 5. REI Co-op. A one-time fee enrolls customers for life. Then they get special pricing, free shipping, bike repairs. The list of benefits is long. 6. Club Publix. The program offers are custom-tailored offering digital shopping tools that make it easier for customers to save on items they tend to buy. The DCA has one more rewards program to add to this list, Starbucks Odyssey. Launched on December 8th, this loyalty program lets customers earn NFTs and other rewards 
that unlock access to benefits and experiences. Starbucks Odyssey is premised on Web3 technologies and was launched initially to a limited group of Starbucks customers. Quite a list of innovative programs, wouldn't you say? Other retailers are surely hard at work trying to compete, and we look forward to see what other innovations 2023 has in store. TikTok has had its share of bad press due to privacy and data security issues. Nevertheless, most Gen Z say that they find the social media platform trustworthy. 65% of U.S. adults born after 1997 and before 2012 say they trust TikTok. Only one half of Gen Xers and just one quarter of boomers have the same faith in the Chinese-owned app as the younger generation. Data from the Harris Poll, Grid, and Yahoo Financial show TikTok is the new Google for Gen Z, who turn to it for culturally relevant content. Today on the show, Dan is having a conversation with Ahmed Siddiqui about his book, The Anatomy of the Swipe. Let's hear what Ahmed has to say. Ahmed, thank you for coming back on Commerce Code. We had a great conversation a few weeks ago about Branch and some of the things that you're doing there. And I mentioned at the end of that episode that I wanted to come back and talk about some things you're doing broadly around education, teaching people about payments. One thing is the book I mentioned called The Anatomy of the Swipe. And then another thing is that you've taken to, to teaching some online classes to help people who are maybe new in payments or maybe you know new into a, a new job or something to kind of understand it better. And so I wanted to just have you on so we could talk a little bit about that. And I, I trust that you are still in uh, sunny, warm Minneapolis. Is this true? Yeah, this is right. Thanks for having me back. Great. So one question, you know, for, for any author, I think, is if I'm talking to 18 or 20 year old Ahmed, does he expect that he's going to write a book someday? Is that, was that kind of the thing or was it more that you just fell into it or how this happen? Probably not at 18 or 20, but maybe a little bit later. I definitely have always had a interest in writing in general and I've had it in my bucket list to write. And what actually happened, I kind of stumbled into this about four years ago when I joined Branch. We actually were not a payments company. The company actually originally started off as a shift swapping and a way to view your shifts for target employees. So what happened is that we found out that while a lot of these workers were you know, happy with the product. They were still making the, their money on the 15th and the 30th, and they were hoping that they can make their money sooner. And we quickly pivoted. And the problem was that nobody had any sort of understanding of payments because we were essentially building an enterprise SaaS product. And I got an opportunity to actually take a class in how to write a book, which is offered by a really good friend of mine. His name is Eric Custer. And I was like, well, yeah, I've actually wanted to always write a book, but, you know, do I have the right content? And I actually did have some content. So, you know, I took the class and I actually, the output of that class was mm. to write this book, which became the anatomy of the swipe. It's one thing to, to do something in your career because you see an opportunity and, and that can be a gutsy and important move. What you did though, is something where you saw the need. I mean, right. Like you were in the middle of the need and there really is, you know, a need. I, I, as I got in as the CEO of digital commerce Alliance, I didn't have a, a particular background in payments, right? I had a more general commercial background and legal background. And so I started looking around, of course, this is how I came across your book. Previous to that, there was, uh, I'm not sure if there was really much of anything that would be accessible to the typical person. That's right. Yeah, there actually isn't very much content out there. And as I was writing this, I knew that because again, when I learned about payments, I kind of had to like figure it out for myself for the most part. The other piece of this is that for engineers, there's a certain way that you want to be able to write things. And, you know, one of the major things I learned as part of the, this class that I took was how do you inject stories into this? How do you make it interesting? And I'm a very visual person and I need a lot of drawings and diagrams and whatnot. And I was like, I want to be able to take those same drawings that are like stick figure drawings and put them in this book to illustrate a point. And that's what's really different about this book is that it is very accessible. It has a comic book in it. So if you like comics, you're going to like this book. What's the key thing that people get out of reading the book that they just aren't going to kind of pick up any other way? 
I think what a lot of people call back is that, you know, when you go to buy a coffee, it seems pretty mundane. You order your coffee, you insert the card, and a few seconds later, you take the card out and you get your coffee, right? But there's actually a lot of stuff that's happening under the hood to make that transaction work. And I think what a lot of people get out of the book is just an appreciation for how complex the world of payments is. But again, you know, it's described in such a way that just about anybody can understand. You don't need to have a degree in payments to be able to understand what's going on. It is complicated, but it doesn't really need to be overly complicated. You know, so the book leads to teaching classes. And and I actually just, just disclosure for everybody, I saw that you were teaching classes and oh, I should take that thing. So I did. But did, did you figure on teaching classes when you were writing the book? I mean, I guess actually what you said already tells me the answer, which is you were already teaching classes. It was just internal to branch. And then you wrote the book that in a way kind of came out of that and said, hey, there's an audience for this that's beyond, you know, just my company. And so that, I mean, is that a fair a characterization of what? Yeah, what no, I mean, I, I think you, you got it pretty well because with the book, one of the best things that I've gotten out of the book is that. I get a lot of messages on LinkedIn from people. And I think even you and I, we connected that way and we you know, got to know each other. But one of the major themes was, you know, hey, I, I read your book. Do you teach any classes? And, you know, I mean, I got it enough where I had it in the back of my head again. And by the way, Dan, the other thing in the back of my head that I've always had is I've always wanted to teach, period. And so like, I always thought, oh, when I retire from working, I'll just go and like be a professor or something. And so I've always kind of had that in the back of my head. I didn't really think about doing it this soon in my career, you know, but there was a need. And again, this is one of those other opportunities that just kind of like came up. So there is a a platform that I teach on called Maven. I think first cohort was back in like June or July. And so far I've done six classes and kind of looking forward to doing one a month go forward starting in February again of next year. And who's a, who's a typical student? Yeah, a typical student is anybody who is just getting into payments or fintech. There actually are a lot of people that have been in the, the field for a long time, but they join the company and they have a specific role within that company. And so they don't know the entire picture. As you're aware, the visas and MasterCards of the world, they're massive, massive organizations with tons of people. And everybody is you know, dedicated to doing a specific function and you don't know everything that's going on. And so it's a really good primer to understand the entire like payment ecosystem. That's great. I'll make a note, you know, for anybody who's listening to this and, and interested in the uh, you know, I mean, to swipe and just a topic overall, I had mentioned earlier a book called Payment System in the U.S., and that really is a very, you know, that's like a, a reference manual almost, right? That, that's a very deep in, you know, kind of thing. There's another book though, too, called, uh, that came out, I think this year called The Field Guide to Global Payments. And I haven't read it yet. I've got it here. I uh, haven't read it yet. And it looks interesting. And it's maybe a little more global and maybe it seems maybe a little bit like touching some things that are not really card-based. I find it interesting because I think it's an area that strikes me as a huge kind of a market overall, which is there's just this flourishing of activity in the space right now where you have people being brought in that weren't intending to have a career in payments necessarily, but they would like you, they kind of wind up at, you know, at a, at a tech company and then it becomes a fintech company. And then maybe there's embedded finance or whatever going on. But they need to understand this thing. And I think there's a great need right now for people to just, you know, for, for a large number of people to have some level of familiarity, if not like the ability to develop more specialist knowledge and payments. It's a fantastic book that I also highly recommend now. Yeah, there isn't like a formal degree or anything in payments. You know, Sophia has a lot of experience, especially on the acquiring side of things. I, my experience is deeper on the issuing side of things. And so I would say that, you know, the books are very complimentary. And also, I think she's done something really amazing where, you know, she's taken this knowledge that she's had in her head and made it available to everybody. And I think, I mean, that was really my goal too. It's like, why keep it all stuffed in your own head? Like if you know something, put it out there and, you know, make it available so other people can actually benefit from it. And I think that was her major purpose in doing this. It looks like she does a bit of teaching too. uh, Like, uh, like, and it's an interesting point about there not being a curriculum. And I I guess what I'd say is being somebody who went to law school and has had a, a career that kind of touched a lot of different points, Law school will almost never 
take you down to the ground level, like the mechanics of how things are actually done. So you're learning all the stuff that's important to be a lawyer, except for where the rubber hits the road. The example that maybe comes to mind for me and the analogous to payments is you can take, you know, how many classes you want on property. They are never going to take you down to the county courthouse to show how property is recorded. And, and that is where the rubber hits the road. In the same way, you can take a class on finance at the, in your MBA program or in a legal program. I took a corp finance thing, but they're never going to tell you how the actual money moves. Like that never comes up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, you can only get that really through experience. But I think as you know, as you see an evolution, I mean, of course, you can. It's understandable because if you were in the days of well, first there was paper money flying around, then there was paper checks flying around until nine eleven. It maybe didn't deserve a class, I guess. But at this stage, it does because we're evolving at much faster and there's creative and interesting and kind of new to world things that can happen. Yeah. I mean, again, historically it hasn't changed the, you know, payments hasn't really evolved or changed in the whole concept. I mean, the word FinTech is still pretty new, even though it's been, you know, happening, but again, we want as many people as possible to be thinking about payments and FinTech and how do we make this content really available to everybody that wants to learn and wants to innovate, I think that's the real goal because we don't know what that next billion dollar payments or fintech unicorn is going to be. But I'm hoping that somebody that took the class may have had a, a spark and, you know, decides to build one of those. Even in the early days when I was at Marketa, a lot of the people there actually did not come from payments background. We all kind of had to like learn everything from scratch. But I think the, the fact that we had this intellectual curiosity for how these things work, that's why you know, we were able to build that platform. And so I always tell people like, be curious and be hungry, always ask questions, question the norm. And it's, it's refreshing to see people questioning the norm because a lot of us who have been in this world, we don't question it. We're just like, yeah, that's just how it works, but maybe it shouldn't. And it's cool getting people with fresh perspectives in on this and get get them to a base level knowledge so they understand, hey, this is how it works, but it doesn't necessarily need to work that way. Well, this facilitates more innovation. You get more people. It takes a lot of people asking those questions to get around to the few that end up having the opportunity and having the situation where they can make a creative new product that solves a big problem, right? And so the more people that you've got in that you're able to bring in through the, the book and the classes and all that kind of facilitate. We can close here on that. And thank you so much for this. Just a fun conversation about kind of building the industry in a, in a way that's kind of open and collaborative and bringing people in and teaching them what you know. So thanks for, for doing that. And we'll look forward to keep it in touch in the future. Yeah, thanks again, Dan. Really appreciate it. Have a good one. Commerce Code is a weekly podcast bringing you conversations with executives who are leading the way in digital commerce. If you like Commerce Code, your company should join the Digital Commerce Alliance and become part of our mission of advancing trade for good through standard setting, industry networking, conferences, and best practice sharing. Check out our website at www.digcomall.org and reach out to Ala Mohammed, our head of member services at ALAA at digcomall.org. On behalf of DCA, have a great week.